Yes, please. Hello everyone! I apparently forgot to mute myself <laughs> while I had the thing up, so I hope I wasn't talking to myself too much. Um, but there'll be a little bit of that today. Hi! I'm Nicole Gallucci, uh, one of your hosts of Learning Space. This is the weekly show about science, education, space, outreach, all those cool kinds of topics. Uh, unfortunately, it's just me today. Our guest, uh, Apollonia Rodriguez, is having some serious internet issues at home and at the office, and so wasn't able to connect. Um, so we are hopefully going to be able to reschedule her to talk about the Dark Skies Preserve. Uh, I think the one of the first, if not the first, uh, Dark Skies Preserve in Alqueva in Portugal. Uh, so uh, we just found out about that mm, 10, 15, 20 minutes ago. <laughs> um, so I uh, happily have a backup plan since I um, am doing a backyard astronomer camp this week um, for two days with my uh, collaborator Sean Herberts here at the SIUE STEM Center. Um, so I'd like to share some of those activities with you guys. Uh, I have a hello from Nancy Graziano in the chat. Hi. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else is uh, coming and saying hello, uh, but please say hello in the Q&A, and I'm happy to answer questions in the Q&A since otherwise this will probably be a pretty short 
a pretty short show since I'm doing this topic last minute. Um, so uh, what we're doing this week is a camp a, for, for local students. We have uh, several students between the ages of 9 and 15. Uh, we're building this as a backyard astronomer camp. I think we were going with backyard, oh yeah, backyard astronomer boot camp. So this is the uh, the cover, the first draft of a cover that uh, was created by uh, Sean Herberts. Uh, we were, if, if Tiny Intern has time, maybe she'll make us another pretty cover too. Um, and it's a two-day camp to introduce students to concepts of light and astronomy and how we do astronomy. In particular, how they can do astronomy on their own. Uh, so set up as a two-day camp, the first day of the camp is going to be all about optical visible light, things that you can see with your eye. And so of course we've got uh, the Galileo scope is actually going to be the featured part of this camp. Um, they, all of the students will be building their own and taking home a Galileo scope and a tripod, so just a standard camera tripod. Um, to do their own observing and with any luck <laughs> the weather will be clear enough one of the two nights that we can actually do a star party with them and show them how to use their Galileo scope. Um, but we're not going to throw them at the telescope first off. Um, we will be doing different things about the properties of light to start off with and so there is a uh, activity called the three B's of light um, which is basically going through different things that you can do with light and so the three B's we haven't figured that out. I know I had a, I, I keep forgetting what they are because they're not the words I would typically use, but it could be blocked and it could be bent. And see, I, I can't remember. It, can, <laughs> it could be blocked, it could be bent, and it could be... So we have reflection, refraction, and blocking, basically. Um, bounced. That's the other B. <laughs> bounced. Um, so, ref, so bounced, blocked, and bent are the three things that they have to figure out that light is doing. So we'll have three stations set up. One will have mirrors, one will have lenses, one will have different types of material they can make shadows with, uh, and they have to figure out what those things do. So it's a pretty straightforward activity uh, going through different things you can do with light. We'll follow up with bending light um, using uh, some of the activities from the National Optical Astronomy Observatory uh, has developed to go along with the Galileo scope kit. You see, I should bring up the Galileo scope. We had a couple of, we had an episode about the Galileo scope fairly recently. Um, you can go to galileoscope.org to, to get them. Uh, they are currently sold in packs of six, and so you could uh, get it for a small group, or you can get a few different packs of six to get for a, um, let me screen share this, to get for a classroom group or a school group, so it's galileoscope.org. Um, and it's a kit that you put together yourself to make the telescope. And what's nice about that, let's see what the assembly is. Uh, there's assembly instructions in various different languages. I don't know how quickly this will come up. Um, but because you get the tube parts, okay, you guys can see that, you get the tube parts and you get the lenses separately. So here are the lenses that you need to put into the tube yourself. You can use those lenses for different activities before they've actually, thank you Nancy, you said bounced. Uh, you can use these um, activities, uh, use these lenses to do different activities along the way. And so uh, we will be using, oh, where to go? I have it, I have it. The Galileo Scope Activity Guide. Yeah, Galileo Scope Optics Activity Guide. So Galileo Scope Optics Activity Guide is what you're looking for. And it has a whole bunch of different activities that you can use, do using the lenses themselves from the kits. Um, what they suggest doing, what we'll be doing, is getting little styrofoam cups and <laughs> getting a whole little slit at the top and having the lens be sitting in those styrofoam cups and moving those around in order to... Um, measure the focal length, figure out what the lenses do, make a, you know, a telescope of sorts that's open air so you can see how all the parts work, and then have the students put together the Galileo scope. So that's kind of an overview of what we're doing for the optical stuff. In fact, Sean is preparing most of the, most of the materials, but he's also prepared um, the activities for all the optical things. Um, 
We've, we have the inflatable planetarium here at the STEM Center, which is really cool, so I will be bringing that out. So with, you know, even if we get clouded out both nights and can't do a star party with the kids, we will be bringing our inflatable planetarium to show them what the night sky looks like. But I'd like to actually get them to learn a little bit about finding their way around the night sky using constellations. Um, I've got, you know, several of my favorite constellation stories in my back pocket that I can bring out. Um, and we'll have the planetarium, and they will be making their own star wheels. So this is a star wheel that was um, made by uh, the, ooh, this is Uncle Al's Hands-On Universe. This is uh, from the Lawrence Hall of Science in California, and they have modified it for the Kepler mission, so I'll put this link in the show notes for um, this special star wheel that this is the northern hemisphere. Um, there's two different pockets, one for 30 to 50 degrees latitude, so mid-latitudes where a lot of us live, and there's another one that has a different circle for people living at higher latitudes. And the star wheel, it's a typical star wheel. They have uh, one without lines and one with lines in the sky. This one doesn't have the lines. Um, but in addition to the usual constellations, uh, it has circled, so this is updated as of the end of 2013, I think, circled the stars in the night sky that are visible to the naked eye that have planets around them. So this has um, different stars that where we know that there are planets. And it also shows the location of the field of view that the Kepler spacecraft was staring at for several years looking for exoplanets and finding uh, up to a thousand exoplanets uh, that we know of so far. So it's a star wheel with a really modern twist because it uh, shows you um, the locations of stars you can look at with your eyes that actually have planets going around them. So we'll be having them making those. We'll be talking constellation stories and, and doing all of that. Um, like I said, with any, with any luck, we will have better weather than we've had uh, lately. Um, we have checking out the comments. Hi, Guido. Uh, open, having some layout problems with the Q&A app, but you can watch open air hangout, watching from the balcony. Pity it's not dark yet. Yes, Guido's in Germany where it is already becoming evening. Uh, where our original guest was supposed to be coming from was Portugal, uh, but unfortunately her internet went went out and so we, she has no connection. Um, Okay, so that's kind of just an overview of what we're doing for the, the first day, and I will be posting links to a couple of these activities on the uh, event pages, and then they'll get scooped into the podcast version for 365 Days of Astronomy. Um, so the second day, this is where I get really excited. So we have one day dedicated to Galileo scope, optical light, backyard astronomy with things you can see with your eyes. Um, which is what you would typically see in a uh, backyard astronomy boot camp, if you were to think of one. The second day is all about invisible light, and this is where I get really excited because I particularly enjoy um, talking about different types of astronomy using light that we can't see with our eyes. And so we'll be introducing them to these different types of light, how they can interact with it in their daily lives, and at the end they will get to play with an itty-bitty radio telescope. Um, but we start off with the electromagnetic spectrum, and there is a, uh, a great NASA activity uh, which I found using NASA Wavelengths, so nasawavelength.org, one of my favorite uh, resources, in which you get a clothesline, and instead of clothesline, we might just put them on a wall. You make a logarithmic scale. So you're teaching them, first off, uh, what a logarithmic scale would look like. You've got, uh, uh, I'm not sure, yeah, so it's got 1, it's got uh, 0, 0.1, 1, 2, <laughs> 10 to the 2. Um, you have a, um, showing them logarithmic numbers and showing a scale. And these are going to tell you um, what wavelengths you're working at. And so um, as you're working at different wavelengths, the students will then uh, begin to identify what types of light correspond with those wavelengths, and so they'll have to start adding these cards. This is all part of a NASA activity in the exponential clothesline, and these are some different objects that they may be familiar with in some way, um, and the sizes that they correspond to, and 
what types of light in the electromagnetic spectrum they correspond to. So, for example, radio waves can be as big as buildings. Uh, of course, the radio spectrum uh, that radio astronomers use range from uh, from tens of meters uh, to mm, centimeters, millimeters, submillimeters. It starts to get a little fuzzy when you're at submillimeter range because some people call it its own thing, some people call it radio. Um, but that's 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 an, a discussion for another day. Uh, but then when you get to something as small as the point of a needle, you're at infrared wavelengths. Ultraviolet. I don't actually see visible. They're all the oh yeah, visible protozoans if they're at all uh, familiar with these particular types of organisms. Molecules, atoms, nuclei, things that are even smaller. And then microwave is thrown in there again. That's uh, kind of the short wave end of the radio spectrum. Uh, things well, yeah, on the scale of humans and butterflies. So pretty big range from our daily experience. So the students will get to match up these different types of objects to give them a sense of hey, how big of a wavelength is that going to be? Um, we were going to try and recreate the Herschel infrared experiment, but I've been having a little bit of trouble doing so. But this is something, if you have, uh, a, if you happen to have a glass prism and several thermometers at home, this is something you should try. So I haven't quite had luck work doing it uh, this time around, but I did do this once in grad school. Um, William Herschel was looking at the, uh, he was trying to d understand the temperature of different wavelengths of light through a prism. And so what he did was, if you've seen uh, this particular Cosmos episode, you've already seen this, he had a prism that created a rainbow on some kind of material, and, and they encourage you to paint the tips of the thermometers black. Uh, that should help it out. Um, and then use a, an actual glass prism to make the rainbow. The prism I had wasn't making a very big rainbow. That could have something to do with it, why it didn't quite work. And he put the thermometer on the yellow color and on the blue color uh, to see, and the, the red, to see what the um, different temperatures of these different types of visible light were compared to each other. And then for one as a control, he put it outside of the red, so where it was dark where there was no light that he could see. And lo and behold, <laughs> um, spoiler alert, that thermometer, so the, the thermometers that were all in the different colors of visible light in the spectrum went up, um, but so did the one that was off of red. It was going up just as much as the others, um, if not more. And so what he discovered was that there was a type of light that existed beyond what we could see in the visible spectrum, and that is known as infrared. And he did this with the sun. Uh, of course, we've had some really cloudy days, stormy days around here, so it hasn't been easy to do it for the sun. Uh, so that could be a, another part of why it hasn't quite been working so well for me this week. Um, but he just, so that's taking the sun as an astronomical object. Uh, that is the um, first, first, yeah, first astronomical observation of uh, uh, using invisible light would, would technically belong to William Herschel uh, with his infrared astronomy experiment. Um, we have, thank you Guido, we have a question. Any good ideas how to get a six-year-old who's starting school this year interested in astronomy? That's a great question. Um, if uh, you have semi-dark skies where you are, even if you don't have dark skies, I think taking taking her outside to see the moon and planets, uh, things that you can still see from the city, would be uh, a good way to get started. And even if you have, so I was about five when I got my first small telescope, really cheapy, terrible, tiny telescope. But looking at the moon through that very small telescope really kind of ignited a spark. Uh, for me. So seeing something up close, um, if you had a telescope where you can show Saturn and Jupiter, those are really impressive from wherever you are. Those are good things um, to, to look at. And the, the I don't, I, this, this may have just been me, but I think I've heard other people uh, say they had this experience as well. Um, learning that the stars were different colors <laughs> and that the colors corresponded to their surface temperature was really an interesting fact that stuck in my head from a very young age. So if you could pull out those weird interesting facts that would interest a six-year-old, um, and in particular if you can tie it into her everyday experiences, um, 
I was able to tie the the color of stars thing to uh, our our toaster oven. So uh, if you have a toaster oven or if you have a, an electric stove, you know that the coil starts off dark black, dark gray, whatever usually, uh, and as it heats up, it'll start to glow dark red and orange. And if it's uh, one that gets really hot, it'll go yellow. If it kept going, it would go white and blue. Um, so you can compare that to what's happening. Excuse me, what's happening is uh, on the surfaces of stars is that you have, um, as you change color, as you go from red to blue in the spectrum, you actually get hotter temperatures. So um, for me, at least tying it in, you know, getting to see astronomical objects close up with your own eye it is a whole, whole new experience um, that would appeal to a six-year-old. And then um, throwing interesting facts that you could tie into everyday experience would be, I don't know, a good way to get them started in astronomy. So I hope that helps. Um, oh, Eric, Eric Christensen is asking, uh, since I will be talking about radio telescopes soon, and uh, is anyone actually listening to the upper HF frequencies, about 23 megahertz for radio astronomy anymore? I know Jupiter makes noise in that spectrum. Uh, there are a couple of projects that are working in low frequency. Let me see if I can get one up. Um, one of my favorites, that, that particular low frequency, you get down to 23 megahertz, it's really tough. Uh, because the ionosphere is, of course, starting to um, be a problem. So the, the Earth's atmosphere is see-through for visible light and for a certain band, certain chunk of the radio spectrum. And 23 megahertz is starting to get to where it's more, more and more difficult to see through. But uh, one of my favorite projects is called the Long Wavelength Array. It's a, an array of dipoles in New Mexico. It's actually the first station is at the site of the very large array in New Mexico. And let me screen share. They have uh, running all the time something called LWA TV. Uh, so the, the, the dipoles are brought together to make an interferometer. And they show uh, the full sky every few seconds, uh, so 30 seconds or so. This is at, uh, let's see, what bands are this? It doesn't say on here. Oh, so this is the intensity. This is this V is just polarization in that same frequency. Um, full sky down to the edge of the sky. And if I don't remember. Oh, here we go. 37.8 megahertz. So this is a bit higher than 23 megahertz. And so things you can see, you can see the galaxy. This is what the sky looks like if you had radio eyes looking at uh, 38, yeah, about 38 megahertz. You'd see the Milky Way in the sky. Um, there is um, a process called synchrotron uh, radiation that's giving off um, radio waves all along the plane of the Milky Way. You have, looks like the sun is right in the middle of Taurus A right now, so it's kind of hard to distinguish them. You can see it changing a little bit. There's something just popped up on the edge. That might be something on the ground. Um, oh, there it is again. <laughs> Taurus uh a and the Sun are kind of on top of each other. Uh, Cass A is, Cassiopeia A is a supernova remnant, and you've probably seen pictures of it. It's really gorgeous and optical and high resolution radio. Um, and, uh, but here it's just a dot. It's just a really big bright dot, and it's the brightest thing in the sky right now. Jupiter is not showing anything in its location. Um, sometimes Jupiter will flare up and you'll see it on here. Um, so Taurus, Taurus A is, is the Crab Nebula, uh, and the Sun are kind of on top of each other. Uh, that's all that's up overhead over New Mexico right now, but check out, uh, I just Googled LWA TV. It's at uh, University of New Mexico, and you can see what this guy's doing at 38 megahertz. Um, this is definitely something I'll be showing our students this week when we get to the radio portion. On screen share. So, yay! Um, and uh, Nancy also uh, added for talking to uh, Guido, Guido talking to the, the six-year-old um, who's starting school, talk to her about the Apollo missions in conjunction with looking at the moon, make it sound really exciting and fun. Uh, I, <laughs> as someone who is removed from the Apollo missions, I'm very, 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 very jealous of those of you who do get to see those live because I would, oh my gosh, I would love to see. Uh, people walking on the moon in my lifetime. 
Okay, so a couple of other things, a couple of other activities we're doing in the Backyard Astronomer Camp on our Invisible Light Day. Um, there are ways of detecting infrared radiation using simple household materials. And uh, try this. Try this at home. This you can try at home. If you have a TV remote, um, typically, or, or DVD player, Blu-ray player, whatever. We have so many remotes in our house. Um, when you, you know, click a button, if you're looking at that little glass bulb at the end of the remote, you don't see anything. It's a little glass bulb, but you don't see any light coming out. Uh, do it for, in front of your cell phone camera. So if you have such a remote, put it in front of your cell phone camera and click the button and look at the image on your screen. And you will see something. You'll typically see something. So your TV remote is probably using infrared. And it turns out that the, uh, the chip, the CCD, the detector that makes up your digital cameras uh, can see that type of infrared light. It can detect that infrared light that our eyes can't do. So like, seriously. Go do it right now. I don't even care if you walk away from the Hangout. <laughs> Check it out. Um, so we'll be using the remote control, uh, the infrared radiation from remote control, um, for them to, to play with and do that. We'll do the bounced and bent and, and blocked uh, activities again. One way to do it is to, um, if you have a television set available where you are, which we won't have, is challenge the students to turn on the television from like a space outside the room where the TV is. Uh, and then they'd have to figure out, all right, I need something to bounce it, I need to reflect it, grab some mirrors, give them some materials, and they'll figure out that, ooh, if I use a certain set of mirrors, um, and we can bounce that light around and turn the TV on. We don't have a TV where we're going to be, but I just discovered this morning <laughs> that my partner Tim has a um, remote control helicopter that also uses an infrared remote control. So we're going to see if we can get them to control the <laughs> in the uh, helicopter with the infrared remote control from from a, a different room and see if they can bounce that around. So that'll be that'll be a fun little experiment uh, for them to check out. But if you have any of those infrared remote controls, you should be able to see its light on your cell phone camera or some other digital camera that you're looking at. Um, I'm checking comments again. Oh, Nancy points out, using the camera on your phone is a great way to determine if your remote is working or not. I've done this many times, yes. If you want to know if the problems with your TV or with your remote, pointing it at your cell phone camera will definitely, uh, definitely help out. Um, oh, Adam. Adam Synergy says, hi, Guido. My daughter is seven. She loves looking at the stars, the planets, meteors, and satellite passes. Getting her to do math is the hard part. <laughs> That's fine. She's only seven. That that's just a start for the math. Um, but uh, yeah, sat looking at satellite passes. Um, those of us in um, mid northern latitudes again are getting us uh, uh, some really great international space station passes overhead this week. So hopefully, if it's not too cloudy, you can catch one of those as well. All right. So we're reflecting infrared light, um, and then we move uh, we move down the spectrum a bit to radio. And we'll have some walkie-talkies. We'll have them going around with walkie-talkies as being um, in um, RFI detectives. RFI stands for Radio Frequency Interference. This is an activity um, that is often done in Green Bank, or conjunction with the Green Bank Radio Telescope, uh, giving kids uh, some way of detecting radiation, radio radiation, either a walkie-talkie or an AM FM radio, if you still have a handheld version of one of those, uh, and finding things that um, make uh, radio waves all uh, around them. This could be, it could be anything electronic. Uh, I know when I tap on my little Fitbit doodad here and the LEDs go off, it'll make a certain electronic scream. Um, so you can have them actually start to investigate the sources of, of radio waves around them. We'll have them doing that. And uh, attempting, we have some rolls of chicken wire in the, uh, in the resource center right now, we're going to have them attempt to build a Faraday cage and actually block. We won't be doing the bent and, and the bounced, but we'll be doing the block, blocked version of um, blocking radio light and seeing that a uh, simple metal screen type material is really good for blocking a lot of radio radiation, even though you can see through it, even though visible light gets through it, and in particular, even though sound gets through it, because a lot of people mix up sound and, and radio waves. Um, 
sound can get through it, invisible light can get through it, but radio waves, that particular wavelengths of light, can't get through it. Um, the highlight of the day for me is the Itty Bitty Radio Telescope. Um, and so you may have heard me talk about this before, probably because I've been wanting to build one forever and just recently have gotten all the parts together. You can search for Itty Bitty Radio Telescope. There are several different um, sites that talk about it. Uh, this is from the NRAO in New Mexico. Uh, this is a site there. There's also the NRAO in Green Bank that has instructions. The SETI League has instructions. And then Itty Bitty Radio Telescope um, involves getting a hold of, this is what it looks like at the end here, a uh, satellite, kind of a direct TV dish, which are super easy to come by, at least for me, they were super easy to come by. Uh, if you're on Craigslist or FreeCycle or any of those sites, um, people take them off their roof and they're literally just giving them away. <laughs> they're just giving these guys away because if, they're, they're, if you're not using satellite TV, you don't need it. Um, so I was able to pick up four of these for free uh, just around the neighborhood and from friends. Um, and what you do is you attach a signal meter in particular, this guy here is called a channel master signal meter. You can use lots of different types of, of signal meters. There are some expensive ones, there are cheap ones. Uh, this particular channel master model um, is not made anymore, but they show up on eBay every once in a while. I have grabbed three of them so far on eBay for fairly cheap. What this signal meter does, um, this is often used by people getting satellite TV to make sure they're pointing at the right place without having it all hooked up to the TV. Uh, it just tells you uh, when you've got a powerful source in your field of view of the telescope. Um, but uh, satellites aren't the only things you can see with this. Uh, you can see the sun. <laughs> the, the one great astronomical source that you can really see with this telescope is the sun. It's not truly a telescope in that you can explore the sky with it, but you can explore the principles of radio astronomy using this. And this is kind of a, a fancier setup. Um, what I eventually want to do is make this, this is uh, just using a Lazy Susan, um, kind of a little platform on wheels that you can spin around. Um, I've also seen them attached to tripods. I'll probably attach mine to a tripod. If you use one of these, these signal meters, you've got to build your own power supply, which is fairly easy. I went to Radio Shack and bought a bunch of parts and uh, did some home soldering and was able to, uh, to connect up the power supply. This is a great little maker project. This is a great um, introduction to electronics project that you might want to do with your kids at home. Properly supervised, of course. I don't need parental supervision for soldering anymore, thankfully. <laughs> um, but that's uh, something that you can do. And so we'll have the, so we've got one already pre-built and we'll have the students using it to uh, investigate uh, the sun. Some other thing, they can see the ground. <laughs> so the um, Everything gives off uh, a little bit of radio waves, and the sky is very radio dark, except when you're pointing right at the sun or at a satellite. Um, but the ground and people are a little bit warmer and give off uh, some radio waves. So if a person stands in front of it, the signal meter will jump. And uh, if you have one that has sound connected to it, I know this might get confusing because radio waves are light, not sound, but it does turn the signal into sound, and the sound goes wee. Um, so I will def. I uh, took some video. Oh yeah, I took some video with uh, Google Glass when I was building this, and put it together. So I'll have to to post that up in a bit. Um, I'm going to check the questions again. <laughs> uh, our neighbor's daughter says Guido again is already showing a little interest. We'll try to have her look through a small telescope this summer, but she's going to bed early. Yeah, I've noticed that um, my summer star parties have had to get later and later, which makes it harder for people to take children, young children, because they go to bed early, but this is when they're out of school, so uh, it's very it's very confusing um, to, to get them through. Um, see if there are any other questions. Oh, William Northcote's ever asking, have uh, ever done ham radio satellite experiments as with FunCube? I have not. Um, I know there are several different ham, there was several ham radio challenges um, where they have uh, set up uh, signals to come from satellites or even the International Space Station and people had to detect them and decode them. Um, but this, I'm just opening up the website you suggested called FunCube. 
Uh, it's a CubeSat. I think we had uh, the CubeSat people on a um, couple months ago. Um, CubeSat is a really small, really inexpensive uh, satellite that you can have launched into, into orbit for you. And this one is FunCube. Looks like it uh, transmits at uh, UHF and VHF frequencies. So you can actually use, if there are any ham radio people out there, which I know there are, um, watching this, uh, you can check that out. That's called FunCube. I'll include that in, sh in the show notes as well. And link that in the show notes as well. So all the fun radio experiments. Um, I have not made a, if anyone asks, thinking I have not made a Radio Jove system yet, but that is, Radio Jove is a do-it-yourself kit that uh, lets you look at Jupiter in radio waves and see uh, the things that are going on with Jupiter. I think a couple of last things we'll be doing with the students. So once we do the infrared and the radio, um, the other major part of the spectrum that we can do, because we don't really have homemade X-ray and gamma ray sources that we can play with, uh, but we can play with ultraviolet light. And I did a short, a while back, short video on uh, using these uh, white plastic beads that are sensitive to ultraviolet light. They actually change colors under ultraviolet light. Um, there are all kinds of products that do that. They're called sun magic changing. It's not magic, it's science, guys. Uh, these UV beads, these UV sensitive beads are really helpful for uh, detecting sources of, infra of of ultraviolet light and also seeing what blocks ultraviolet light. Does your clothing block it? Does certain types of sunscreens block it? Do your sunglasses block it? Um, you can kind of use those beads to test all of those things and we'll have them doing an actual double blinded experiment with some, um, some uh, bottles of different types which will probably have sunscreens in them of different uh, strengths and they'll have to determine which is the strongest and which is the weakest and line them up all in between using the ultraviolet beads. Um, this uh, works really well out in the sun, obviously. If it's not sunny, though, you can usually get a UV lamp, um, such as a black light or something similar, um, to be your artificial ultraviolet source, because most of our lighting here won't actually give off ultraviolet light. That'll set off the beads. So that is, is a good time. And if we have extra time, we talked about possibly trying to measure the speed of light in a microwave using chocolate. Um, there's a cool little instructables on how to do that, um, but I'm not yet sure if we'll be able to do that. Um, if we have a microwave, we can borrow and do uh, that with. We'll be showing them pictures of uh, different, different astronomical sources um, in different wavelengths. It's always a good thing to show is uh, what does the Andromeda galaxy look like in infrared? Was it like an optical? Was it look like a radio? And ultraviolet? All these um, different wavelengths are different ways of seeing the same stuff in the night sky. And so we'll be taking those those two days um, to explore all those different ways. So we'll have students using getting a Galileo scope to take home um, and a tripod to, to use with it and uh, hopefully being able to view the visible night sky one of the nights that were out there. And we'll, unless it's completely storming, uh, we can use the itty bitty radio telescope to help them see the sun. So it's actually nicer if it's completely cloudy but not raining because we can be outside and point in the direction of where the sun is. And even if you can't see the sun through the clouds or can barely see the sun through the clouds, the itty bitty radio telescope will pick it up. Uh, so, and I've got, like I said, three more dishes and several more signal meters just laying around in my garage uh, that I'll be making more out of. Um, I'll be sure to post all the pictures and videos that we get, uh, that I get from building and construction and testing and that we get with the students um, actually getting to use them and uh, put them up. Uh, I'm going to check the comments once more if you guys have any questions. I realize this was a very short last minute put together show since unfortunately our guest was not able to make it. Um, but I will be including the links of all these different activities that uh, myself and, and my collaborator Sean Herberts will be doing the next two days with a group of students here in Illinois. Um, and so if you want to do a backyard boot camp, astro uh, yeah, backyard astronomer boot camp of your own, you have some ideas to get started. Uh, so I'll check the uh, comments again really quickly. Mm, they always get uh, reordered on me. 
Uh, okay, here we go. Nancy says, uh, older laptops before Bluetooth had infrared emitter detector pairs that could be used for syncing devices. Often the communication was wonky, so we used our phone cameras to see if anything was being exchanged. I did think about, um, but yeah, most of my devices are Bluetooth now, which is a radio frequency, not infrared. So that doesn't work as well. Um, but some of the older stuff was infrared. Uh, wireless mouses and things like that are something to, to check out. Uh, that's all I have for today. Again, uh, we will be rescheduling our topic, uh, Dark Skies, the Dark Sky Preserve in Portugal and Alqueva uh, with Apolonio Rodriguez uh, when her internet is back and working again. So thank you guys for, for coming and showing up and for watching and listening. Even though we had to change our topic 10 minutes before showtime, I hope you enjoyed some of the descriptions of um, the different activities that you can do with students, uh, with kids for backyard astronomy. I hope you get a chance to maybe try some of them out in the near future. And feel free to send us, send me any questions. I am Noisy Astronomer. Uh, I'm with CosmoQuest. Uh, this was Learning Space. Uh, our upcoming shows will be on Friday, uh, which I will not be there because I'll be doing this camp, uh, but Friday at noon Pacific. Fraser Kane will be doing the Weekly Space Hangout. We'll be rounding up all the astronomy stories of the week. Um, the Virtual Star Party has officially moved to its month, new monthly schedule, so I don't, I don't think there's a Virtual Star Party coming up. I've got to fix the Google Calendar on that. Um, but they're moving to a monthly format um, since they've been having so much trouble with weather and whatnot. Um, Let's see, the last one was on June 1st, so they will be doing it again at the beginning of, uh, probably at the beginning of July. I'll have to check, I'll have to double check with them. Um, but the virtual star party on Sunday nights is moving to a monthly format, it won't be weekly anymore, um, and they'll be running a show regardless of weather and astronomer availability because they will use the month to build up fun and interesting images and movies and animations from their astronomers to show if uh, everybody's clouded out that particular night. Um, so that's the virtual star party. I will uh, will be check out the virtual star party page on Google Plus for the schedule coming up. Uh, Astronomy Cast is noon Pacific on Mondays. Uh, Fraser Kane and Pamela Gay talk about the universe, what we know, and how we know it. Uh, right now, they're doing a series on numbered places. Um, so, tricking names of things, that, like things like Area 51, uh, things that have numbers in them and kind of getting into the background of that. Um, and then that comes back around to Wednesday. So next Wednesday, Learning Space will be live from the Investigate Teacher Professional Development Workshop. <laughs> Since we, I thought, we, we thought about canceling because George and I are both doing two different teacher workshops that week, that day in particular. Um, but I, instead of canceling, we're going to invite you to come along. So we have 20 teachers that are taking our CosmoQuest Investigate workshop, which will uh, go over lesson plans uh, related to small bodies in the solar systems. Um, small bodies in the solar system, asteroids, comets, meteorite, meteoroids, <laughs> meteoroids, meteors, meteorites, and all the differences of those things. Uh, and then we'll get them using asteroid mappers and explore some of the science of Vesta. So, uh, so yeah, so I'll be doing a live broadcast from the back of the lab or the classroom. We have a connected lab and classroom, which is fantastic, uh, at the school that's hosting us at Whiteside Middle School. Uh, so I'll bring some of those teachers in to talk about their experience with the workshop and show whatever particular activity we're doing at the time that we're broadcasting. So you get to kind of join in uh, for, for a little bit for, during our week-long Investigate workshop. Next week, same time, same place here on Learning Space with CosmoQuest. Uh, thanks, guys, for hanging out with me. And, uh, you know, our, my last minute, uh, my last minute uh, show idea, and uh, for keeping the conversation going in the Q&A and sending me questions and all that fun stuff. So that was it for Learning Space. Thank you, and I'll see you next week. Bye.